Confirmation.com processes more than a trillion dollars a year in confirmation data. It is the world's leading online audit confirmation solution, bringing security and efficiency to the confirmation process. Our patented cloud-based service is the preferred provider of electronic confirmations for the AICPA and is endorsed by the American Bankers Association. So the audit process is a 100-year-old paper process that we've been doing since the 1920s. The very first confirmations that, that we know about were the ones that were being done in the 1920s with the McKesson and Robbins fraud that took place, uh, where the executives had misdirected confirmations that were mailed uh, to addresses in Canada. Uh, but the paper process really hasn't changed very much in our profession uh, in that 100-year process. And it's still a very manual process today when you're sending paper confirmations or fax confirmations. It, typically what you're going to get, the research shows, is somewhere between a four to six week average turnaround time. You're going to be doing 30 plus steps just to get the first confirmations back and the error rates are going to run right over 40 percent, right at 43 percent with all the academic research will tell you today. And it's a very difficult process to track. With that 43% error rate, what that means is you're going to send a second request. You're going to have to mail a paper confirmation again. That's going to go through another four to six week process. Again, when you get those back, you've got another 43% error rate. So at that point, you're either mailing a third request or you're sending a fax confirmation for that third request. And end to end, that process is going to take at a minimum four weeks, and it could take as long as two to three months to get those confirmations back. In addition to the inefficiency that's inherent in the paper process, what you've got is a process that's very open to fraud. In the process of sending a confirmation, what happens is CPA firms very rarely actually validate the location of where they're sending a confirmation or the individual who responded to that confirmation to know if they're the right person. The companies who are sending private client information back to what they think is a CPA firm never validate whether or not that really is a valid CPA firm that they're sending that private client information to. And so what you've got is a process that on either end, nobody knows who's on the other side of that transaction. What that means is that as an auditor, we've got to control the process. We need to know where we're sending that confirmation. Is it really that third party company that we're sending a confirmation to? And who at that, that third party location is sending that confirmation back? Are they authorized and knowledgeable and responsible for returning that confirmation back to us? So let's look at the standards, and that'll help us understand the steps that we go through as CPAs in controlling the process. When I was a staff auditor, all the steps that I was taught, I was led to believe that those were steps to help me identify fraud in the process. Now that I've gone back and looked at the, at the standards as they were written in 1990 and issued in 1991, what I've come to understand is that those steps in the process really are there to help us identify errors, not fraud. Because if you think about it, SAS 67 comes before SAS 82, and that was the first time we in the profession admitted the word fraud in a standard. That was since updated in SAS 99, but SAS 67 really gives us the framework for how we're supposed to send confirmations, and I'll show you how the steps that we do to control the process are error steps, not fraud identification steps. So SAS 67, the primary steps in the process are that we're supposed to maintain control, that we have to, to direct that confirmation to a third party who we know is knowledgeable and free from bias in the, in the confirmation process. And we've got to, as a professional auditor, we've got to maintain professional skepticism throughout the process. Um, what was also going on in 1990 and 91 is that a new technology had come out. The fax machine had just started to come out and be uh, integrated into the workplace. And so the standard setters at the time said what we needed to do was verify through a telephone call with the purported sender that the source and contents of that facsimile were correct and then asked, asked the sender to mail that original back to us in the mail. Now I was taught as a staff auditor and again as a senior I, I taught my staff that those steps were steps that would help us to identify fraud. But that's not the case at all. If you look at the process, let's think through how the fraud would happen. If I verify with a telephone call to somebody who is a fraudster and I don't know it at the moment, and I'm a staff auditor and I pick up the phone and call them, is my telephone call going to actually scare them into admitting that they've just committed fraud and sent me a fraudulent confirmation response? Probably not. So what good is it then to ask that fraudster to mail me an original in the mail? Really nothing, because all they're going to do is fill out that confirmation with the balance that they want me to have and mail it to me. I often tell people if I was a fraudster, I'd send you six originals in the mail. It's not going to help you uncover fraud. So then why do the standard setters put put those two steps into the standard. The real reason is error. At the time, the fax machine was a new technology. It had just gotten into the workplace, 
And there was two things that we need to know about that. First, it was new technology, and so we didn't know whether or not the fax machine would actually transpose numbers, change a five into an eight. Maybe it would send one firm's confirmation to another firm. So we were verifying in the, with a telephone call that A, the confirmation's correct and the balance information on it is accurate, and that the confirmation came from the correct party. So then why mail the original in the mail? Again, had nothing to do with fraud and had everything to do with error because at the time, plain paper fax machines had not come out. We were still using the old thermal paper fax machines and the ink disappeared after two years, which doesn't make for very good audit evidence. So as you think about it, these steps had nothing to do with fraud and had everything to do with the new technology that was in place at the time. About 10 years after SAS 67 was issued, the standard setters came out with Practice Alert 2003-1 in January of 2003. In it, they made sure that they emphasized that as a profession, we need to make sure that we maintain control over the confirmation process due to the high number of high profile confirmation frauds that had taken place in recent years. What it also said was that we need to make sure that we had an active response from a responding party and that using the client's online banking capability is not an audit confirmation. It's actually a passive response and doesn't meet the definition of a confirmation. We also said that we were discouraging alternative procedures in lieu of a confirmation because confirmations are a valuable part of the audit process. The practice alert then went on to address emailed confirmations. And in doing so, they said, let's do the same things we're doing with fax confirmations. We needed to verify the source and contents in a phone call to the purported sender and then ask them to mail the original back. So if you send a fax confirmation or an emailed confirmation now, you have to call the purported sender document the phone call, and then ask them to mail the original to you back in the mail. In 2010, the Auditing Standards Board issued an update to the confirmation standard. The IASB, which governs international auditing standards for confirmations, also updated their standard, ISA 505. The PCAOB is also looking at updating its confirmation standard and has issued a couple of exposure drafts requesting comments from the profession on ways it can update its confirmation standard. When you're thinking about the confirmation process and you're comparing the electronic confirmation to the paper confirmation, a good way to emphasize the difference is to think about your university mailroom. When you're working in a group project, how often would you really use the mailroom to efficiently and effectively communicate with your group members? In this same way, when the auditor is considering sending a confirmation to their group member, the bank, in order to obtain audit evidence, the Paper confirmation does not provide the efficiency and the effectiveness that an electronic confirmation would. Even audit stakeholders, audit constituents, are surprised to learn that auditors still use the paper confirmation process. In fact, just last summer when the PFG best confirmation fraud was uncovered, the Fox News anchor chuckled at the fact that auditors would still use paper confirmations. We certainly need your <laughs> suggestions right now, but we do have um, one of the people who helped figure this whole thing out. Confirmation.com is a company that played a big role in discovering the fraud in the first place at PFG Best. The company's founder, Brian Fox, is joining us now. This just has to do with um, online automated um, mm -hmm. audit confirmations. Correct. But and, and uh, Russell Wassendorf Sr. actually fought the push by the Futures Association, right, to sign up for these um, online confirmations or these electronic confirmations. Why, though, did it take so long for the Futures Association to adopt your technology and basically uncover this? Sure, you know, and, and that's the, the question that, that really everybody's asking, but what, what the NFA can be applauded for here is moving uh, to electronic confirmations. You know, this is a, a fraud that unfortunately we've seen happen way too often, and this is a textbook case of confirmation fraud. Uh, where there's two sets of books, they provide right. their orders with one set, and uh, they keep the honest set. So there was, it, it was in, on paper, essentially, up until very, very recently. In other words, they had Not to... mail! <laughs> <laughs> right, so they had to move to you guys. Correct. And it was almost, it was about a week ago or whatever, and then the next day, we have the news the guy tries to kill himself. Is that, is that how it really, is that's that the right. timeline? We, we, we've been doing, as a profession, uh, audit confirmations on paper for about 100 years. The frauds date back all the way to McKesson and Robbins in the 1920s. Um, but in this case, what you see is the, tr the switch from in, in paper confirmations, which have right. been used for 20 years in this case, and within 24 hours of our service, confirmation.com being used, he the fraud knew. was uncovered. He knew right. they were onto him. He knew he was done. I think this just goes to show how much more efficient and effective the electronic confirmation process can be, not only from our standpoint, but of the standpoint of our stakeholders and those who use our audit services. 
While the PCOB proposed standard on confirmations was proposed in 2010, the confirmation standard remains on the active agenda of the PCOB for the coming year, underscoring the importance of this topic in your coursework. Let's walk through now how the Auditing Standards Board and the IAASB have updated the confirmation standard and look at what the PCOB is looking at doing as well. The first thing the standards headers did was update the definition of an external confirmation to include direct written responses to the auditor from a third party in paper form or through any other electronic medium, which includes electronic confirmations. The second thing the standards headers did was address the reliability of the confirmation process. We have to make sure that the responding party really is that entity that mailed the confirmation, and we have to make sure that the employee who works for that responding party is authorized to respond to that confirmation request, because not every employee is authorized to respond to an auditor's confirmation. Certain employees are the ones who have the authority to respond to that confirmation request, and it's important to know who those authorized parties are. The third thing that the standard setters did when they looked at the reliability of the confirmation process was said that we need to make sure that the process is secure and can't be compromised, which would lead to a fraudulent confirmation response. The next thing the standard setters did was to address direct access to information held by the third party responding entity, i.e. using a bank's online banking platform and using the client's ID and password to log in is not a confirmation. It's a passive response and does not meet the definition of a confirmation. And if your client provides you their ID and password to their online banking platform, you've probably got an internal control issue. To ensure reliability of electronic confirmation process, you need to make sure that the responding party really is that entity and verify that the person is authorized to respond to that confirmation. You can do that a number of ways. If you're emailing a confirmation, you need to call that person, verify that they sent the confirmation, and then make sure that the information in it is accurate and correct. Other third-party electronic confirmation systems will do that for you. Any electronic confirmation service that you use, you need to make sure that the security is in place so that you can rely on that confirmation process. Things to look for are a SOC 1, a SOC 2, or a SOC 3, and even internationally you need to look for an ISO 27001 certification. Oral confirmations are not a confirmation, so speaking to someone over the phone to verify information that the client's provided you is not a confirmation. It is an alternative procedure, but it's not an external confirmation. The standard setters have also taken a look at how we perform mailed or emailed confirmations, and in doing so, what they recognized was that almost universally, people weren't validating the mailing addresses or email addresses of where we were sending a confirmation. So the standard setters have said that we need to confirm the validity of the mailing addresses, whether mailed through the U.S. Postal Service or sent via email, before we send those confirmations. A couple of additional items that the PCOB is looking at is expanding the role and requirement for receivable confirmations to things like credit sales, loans, or other transactions. In addition to expanding the requirement for receivable confirmations, the PCOB is looking at requiring cash confirmations in addition to the receivable confirmations that we already have to send during the course of an audit. In its inspection process, the PCOB had identified a few cases where internal auditors were actually in on the fraud with management. So one of the things it's looking at doing is not allowing internal auditors to participate in the confirmation process any longer.